Oh, what a joy to work alongside Phil and Crystal. Well, what a blessing they are. I don't know about you, I am really uh, looking forward to anticipating, excited about Sunday morning service to hear Marlon Hoyle preach. How about you? Sunday morning. What would you give on a normal Sunday morning to be able to hear that? And uh, so is there anybody here that would just agree with me and uh, covenant to pray throughout this day for tomorrow morning service, for just a breakthrough of the Lord in tomorrow morning service? To have a glorious moving of God in tomorrow morning service. So thank you. Thank you for your prayer. Yes, I am overjoyed to have my wife with me. I'll, I'll be transparent with you. It's wonderful to have her with me. And uh, also to meet so many of you, and, and you have been so warm. One of the things, Brother Mike, we love about Christian Union people is the warmth. Marlon and I have talked about that, the warmth and love we feel from you all, and uh, thank you. It's been a special privilege just be with uh, familiar ones this week, and uh, you may not know this, but um, Pastor Mark Arney and I were college uh, classmates and also at seminary, and so it's been really good to be with him this week and have some time together. And uh, if there's anybody I've ever known that exemplifies what I want to preach about this week, it's him. And uh, so I hope you get to know him, and uh, I just appreciate him and the time this week. I'd like you to turn to 2 Timothy 4, if you would again, 2 Timothy 4. I'm so excited to share, share this with you. This is my favorite message of the uh, series, and so uh, we saved that just for you all, special on Saturday morning here. So thanks for coming. Thank you for coming. Second Timothy 4, um, this is kind of a larger chunk of a passage. This is from verse 9 down through verse 22. Uh, tomorrow night, I'm going to go back up to the previous verses. But in verses 9 through 22 is kind of his, uh, his closing of this letter, the closing words. Keep in mind that these are the final words, probably, that Paul... Uh, well, that, for, that we have from him on this earth. He may have written other things, but, but these are the final inspired words from the Holy Spirit that Paul wrote on this earth. So they're very weighty. I'd like to just read them this morning. I don't usually do this, but we're all here together. I'd like to read this this morning, beginning in verse 9. He says to Timothy, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must be aware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Down to verse 19. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesephorus. It's a good next grandchild name there. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Do your utmost to come before winter. Eubulus greet you, as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. You ever gone to um, your in-laws family reunion? Anybody? Who's been to the in-laws family reunion? Was it kind of overwhelming? There's all these people you're supposed to meet. There's all these stories you hear. It's kind of like drinking out of a fire hose, right, of information. Now, my wife's family reunion on her mother's side, there's like, her grandpa was one of 10, 12 kids, and then her mom was one of 10 kids. So there's like a bazillion cousins, and you wear name tags. And it's coded um, according to who you are or what you, so my, my code on my name tag was, if I get this right, 2 e 3A, I think. Basically, that's just above paramecium on the, on, the, on the scale of existence in the family. But you know what I'm talking about? It's like all of the information, people, stories, this is cousin so-and-so, this is uncle, that's aunt so-and-so, that's grand, all, all of this, it, it's impossible in one day to just take in all that information. 
That's a similar experience to reading what we just read. When you read the end of the letter, you're reading all of these relationships. It's like a lifetime of relationships that you're reading about in those five. Do you, do you get that? It's like going to family reunion. You can't catch up in 10 hours a lifetime of relationships and stories. And so that, you just imagine all of these it's impossible. Now, now, I shared with you the other day, my, my wife calls me detail man because I like to dig into the details and I, I would love to, uh, we don't have time this morning because I know you all want to eat lunch, but uh, it, we, it's impossible to go into all the details, of, but every one of those has a, has a background and a story. All those people that he mentions, each one of them he has a relationship with and there's a story and a background to each one of those stories and it'd be impossible. But I think this morning there's, there's kind of two general takeaways if you look at it overall. And one is that you, you realize as you look at this that Paul was in process as well. Isn't it encouraging to know when we, we've talked this week about holiness and sanctification being a crisis and a process, remember? Amen? Can't be one or the other. It has to be both and. Entire sanctification perfect heart in a moment, and then working that out in our lives and our attitudes and habits and our words and our thoughts and our, our actions, right? That's the process. And isn't it encouraging to know that even the Apostle Paul was in process? Now, that's really encouraging to me because I say if it's okay for Paul to be being sanctified and in process, it's okay for John to be in process too. So one is that what you see of this glimpse at the end of his life that's not the way he always was. Amen. This isn't the way Paul always was. Does anybody happen to remember that this, this here fella used to be named Saul, and he wasn't exactly a warm, fuzzy kind of person? <laughs> isn't it great what Jesus can do in a person's life? This, this wasn't, you know, he didn't go to, um, you know, personality self-improvement classes to learn how to be this way. This is Jesus Christ in his life. This is what God does. So this is, this, is the, this, this is, you see growth in Paul's own life, even in this letter. And isn't it, isn't it great this morning? Um, Christians, holiness people are growing people. Amen? Are you growing? You growing? Can the people in your life tell? Can the people in my life, can, can my kids see growth? Do I have a new testimony? Praise God for what he did back there, but oh God, thank you for what you did this week at camp meeting. He spoke to me. We're growing people. So you see that in Paul's life, that he's growing. A second general observation, I would say, is that what you notice here at the end of his life is obviously he's at the end of his life. We'll talk tomorrow night where he says, you know, the time of my departure is at hand. He's on death row, very, very, it's a harsh environment he's in. And he's getting ready to be executed any day now, maybe in a few months from now. And he's definitely at the end of his life and he's diminishing physically. And it, 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 it proves true what he said back in 2 Corinthians, I think it was chapter 4, verse 16. Remember he said, the outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. And what we see in this letter here at the end is definitely Paul's outward man is perishing. I compare it to like a barn or, or, or a building, and it's like the older it gets, the paint starts chipping off. Anybody have any chipping paint in your life, in, 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 your, in your physical body? In these, Anybody feel like your paint's chipping? <laughs> the paint's chipping off, right? The older we get, it's just natural. That's just a part of life in this fallen world is... Our outward man is going to perish. And, and just like the barn, when the paint starts chipping off, you start to see what's underneath the paint, right? And in a person's life, when the paint starts chipping off our life, the older we get, the more of what we are is seen. Isn't that true this morning? Can I say that again? The older we get and the more the outward man perishes and the more the paint chips off, you're going to see more and more and more of what we really are. I'll share this more on tomorrow night, but there's a spiritual principle that we are becoming now what we will be at the end of our lives and into eternity. 
There's no magic holiness wand that gets waved over you at the at, over me at the end of my life and says, voila, there you're a great, whole, sanctified, holiness person. That that takes place over time, right? That's why sanctification, this process thing that we're we're all called to, is important, right? Because we're becoming now, right here this week, we're becoming what we will be. So I, I propose to you this morning that what you're seeing in Paul's life, it, it's just the paint's chipping off and there's not a lot of paint left here. And what you're seeing is just what's inside of him in this letter. So the, here's the question, what are you seeing? And if you see anything in Paul's life, one of the things you see so strongly here in these verses is relationship. Is anybody struck this morning with how many and how deep his relationships with people are. Do you see that? And, and realize, again, as I said, there's a story behind each of these that would take all day. Uh, we could take an hour, two hours, three hours on each one of these names to go through scripturally the background of who that is and how Paul has a relation. It's like family reunion. Want to see the slideshow? You know, <laughs> But we don't have time for that this morning. But just look, if I may, just if I may, just let me summarize if, you know, some of the names, not even all of the names. Let, let me just give you like just a, a two-second summary on maybe a few of them. Verse 10, Demas was, he called him a close friend and fellow laborer in a couple other letters. Crescens probably ended up being the bishop of Galatia, where Paul had started the Galatian churches. Titus, of course, you know, is the young pastor that Paul mentored and he wrote the letter to. Verse 11, Luke was his physician and his companion during his missionary journeys and now in his imprisonment. Mark, verse 11, otherwise known as John Mark, is the guy that Paul got really irritated with on the first journey. And then they split over him on the second journey. And now he considers him one of his close brothers and fellow laborers, according to a couple other letters. Tychicus was a guy from Asia, which was one of four additional men that Paul mentored, according to Acts 20. And he accompanied Paul on his third missionary journey, and Paul often used him as a messenger. Aquila and Priscilla were some fellow tent makers that he met on the street in Corinth. And they ended up being partners with him in the gospel, and, he, and they helped him in Ephesus. Erastus was a city government official. Isn't that kind of cool? <laughs> he was a government official that Paul met, got saved in Corinth, and he helped Paul in ministry. Trophimus was another guy from Asia that was mentioned as one, of, that he's another one of the four guys that Paul mentored and accompanied him on his third missionary journey. Whew, Paul had a lot of relationships. <laughs> And again, every single one of those has a background to it. But this is something that Paul always did in ministry. One of the things that blew me away as I started seeing this, have you ever had this experience? Have you ever gotten a new vehicle and then you started noticing that model everywhere? You know what I mean? When did everybody start driving Honda Odysseys? My goodness, where are they? Where did all those come from? I got to noticing Paul's into relationship everywhere in his ministry. Did you ever notice on his journeys how many times he'd even go back to churches? Paul was not what I call a hit and run, hit and run evangelist. You know what a hit and run evangelist is? Hit him with a message and run. <laughs> you know, that's not, he's not a hit and run evangelist. He goes back to churches. And some of those churches, he stays with them for a long period of time, like 18 months or a, Three years sometimes in places. And when he can't go, he writes letters. And when he can write a letter, he sends some. Hey, Timothy, hey, Silas, you go there. Quo, Priscilla, you stay over there. He's always in contact and relationship with these people. I thought it'd be interesting to get a map of the Mediterranean, where, where Paul was. And I thought it'd be interesting to put a pin. I'm a map geek, Bible maps. It'd be interesting to put a pin in every spot where Paul had poured his life into somebody. What would the map look like if he put a pin every place Paul had poured his life into a person? What would our map look like? What would John's discipleship map look like? Pin wherever I poured my life into a person. Now this is so important to Paul He's even doing it with his last breaths. <laughs> even in his last words, what's he doing? 
talking about and investing and greeting and talking about the people with whom he has relationship. He still, because it's a priority of life. It is a priority of the Christian life. Others, right? Because isn't it true this morning, somebody once said, I think even this week, the only thing we can take to heaven with us is people. Isn't it worth everything to take as many as we can with us? <laughs> Wouldn't you give your life to take as many of your family with you as you could? Wouldn't we give anything we had to take as many of these young people with us as we can? Wouldn't it be worth everything? Wouldn't it worth give, give up anything in my life to take as many people from my town or my community as we can? Don't that sound like holiness? Isn't a holiness message that it's not about me, it's about others? Amen. Wait, I think we need to say that again. <laughs> holiness means it's not about me. Amen. And holiness churches are full of growing, maturing saints who say, it's not about me. So pastor, whatever we need to do with the music, it's not about me. No, as long as, it's, as, long as we're singing about Jesus, and if I can understand the words, that's helpful too. But anything else is okay with me. If it glorifies Jesus and if it helps reach his others, I'm all for it. Amen. Whatever the service time is, whatever reaches others, I'm all it's not, it's not about me. Do you realize how much it would do for our churches if it wasn't about me? That's holiness, right? A, an evidence of sanctified people is it's not about us, it's about others. Now, some of you know, I've served the church in various capacities. Um, evangelist, I've been a pastor. Many, many people don't realize I've been a missionary in the Church of the Nazarene. I was a missionary. Arkansas. I was a Yankee missionary to Arkansas. When I was a pastor in Arkansas, a friend of mine pastored another Nazarene church in Arkansas in a different community. And he and his church, he and the church board, began to feel unanimously. It was very clear from God. They needed to reach new people in their community. They prayed about it a long time. Pastor and the church board felt very clear they needed to make a kind of a transition in music worship style in the church. Now, for many years, that church had sung all hymns, which is not bad, all hymns with a piano and an organ in every service. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. But they began to feel they need to get a little more contemporary to reach the people in that community. You had a lot of young families in that community. So they prayed, they sought the Lord, they felt very clear, and they were heading at that, that direction. The thing the pastor was most nervous about was the church organist. I'm going to just call her Ethel. This is a true story. I'll just call her Ethel. Ethel had been playing the organ in that church for a long time, every service, on that piano bench, maybe for decades. Ethel was on that organ bench every Sunday, every Wednesday night, every Sunday night for many, many years. Pastor was really nervous about talking to Ethel about this transition because they wouldn't be using the organ in the services. So he got up all the courage he could, fasted for a week, went out there to talk, about, to talk to Ethel one day about this transition and to try to kind of with grace explain this and kind of love on her through this process. And he explained it to Ethel. And after the pastor shared this with Ethel, that we won't be using the organ anymore in the services. Ethel looked at that pastor and she said, Pastor, do you think I could learn how to play the bass guitar? And she did. And Ethel played the bass guitar in that church worship band. Do you know that's the greatest example of holiness I've ever heard of in my life? It's not about me, is it, folks? It's about bringing as many people with us as we can. That's why he's so into the relationships. But it's not, it's not just, did you notice how deep the relationships are? It's not just surface relationships, it's deep. It's so deep that he even longs to be with them. 
Did you notice that? He loves being with. People aren't just a necessity to him. He loves being with them. In verse 9, he tells Timothy, be diligent to come to me quickly. That's a double. It's like saying, hurry up and get here fast. <laughs> I just want to see you. I just love you so much, I want to be with you. In verse 11, he says, Luke is with me. And then he says, oh yeah, get Mark and bring him with, because I want to be with him too. And in verse 21, he says, but do your utmost to get here before winter. Hurry up, I want to see you. That sounds like what he said in other letters. Same, remember, same model of car everywhere. He says this in like 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. He says, brethren, having been away from you for a short time, I endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. I, I want to see you all. In 1 Thessalonians 3.10, he says, Night and day I pray exceedingly that we may see your face. I want to be with you. I love you guys. I want to see you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that's not a strange thing at all for Christians. In his book called Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I'm not going to read the whole quote, let me just read this first part. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in his book Life Together, the believer feels no shame as though he were still living too much in the flesh when he yearns for the physical presence of other Christians. Christians love being with other Christians. Relationship. People aren't just a necessity. We just don't need a crowd to fill the numbers. Paul says, I, I love you guys. I want to be with you. I want to be with you in presence, and I need you. Isn't it interesting how the tone of this passage we read in 2 Timothy 4 is, I, I need you, Timothy. There's no sense of pride. There's no shame in saying, I, I, I really, I'm depending on you. Come to me quickly. Get Mark. Bring him. He's useful to me for ministry. Now again, that's not new to Paul either. He's always, if we didn't realize it, Paul wasn't this like amazing, self-supporting, self-sufficient missionary. Paul was depending on the churches. He talks to the Philippian church about this when he says in chapter 2, verse 25 of that letter, he says, he talks about Epaphroditus who ministered to my need. He talks about in chapter 4, verse 15, about you, you have met, uh, in chapter 4, verse 16 of Philippians, in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. It's not new to Paul. It's the body of Christ concept that he talks about in 1 Corinthians 12. Now again, you guys want to go to lunch, so we won't go to length in that. But the body of Christ. Now we all understand this morning, don't we, that Jesus is our provider. Amen? Jesus is all we need. Jesus is our source. He's the vine that supplies us the branches. Amen? But isn't it true, friends and loved ones this morning, isn't it true how often he does that through one another? Jesus meets our need and ministers. It's him, but how often, maybe all the time, he does it through one another in the body of Christ. We need each other. It's not the independent kind of attitude of the world. I don't need anybody. I got this. I'm good. No, no problem. Hey, I, I'll, I'll take care of this on my own. No, not at all. This is a dependence. That's a lie from in the, the idea of I can do this myself. That's a lie from the enemy. Do you realize that even Jesus himself is dependent? Amen? Think about it. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit models an interwoven and interdependent life, does it not? The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit depending upon one another. And when Jesus became fully man, as he's fully God, fully man, fully God, fully man, when Jesus became fully man, was he not dependent on others? When Jesus was a fetus in his mother's womb for nine months, did Jesus not depend upon Mary? Didn't he? Or did this voice come from the room? No worries, Mom, I got this. <laughs> depended on his mother? He depended on his mother and his father as he was an infant? As he was raised? He was dependent on, when he became an adult, he's dependent on 
places, people like Mary, Martha, and, and Lazarus, who he goes to their home as they minister to him. Some of the women that followed him provided for the needs of him and the disciples. When he's going to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, he pleads with the disciples, would you come please watch and pray with me? Did Jesus not depend upon others by choice? So when we see this in Paul's life, we don't say, oh man, he really got this wrong. Oh, he depends upon others. He must not be spiritual, not really sanctified. He's, a, he's kind of, there's a shortcoming of some kind. No, this is God's design, is it not? This kind of relationship and depending upon one another, that's God's design. But there's a risk to it, you know. The risk is you're vulnerable to get hurt by having relationships and deep relationships with people, boy, it's a lot easier to not have a relationship than at least we think we're not going to get hurt, right? Don't go deep. Don't be dependent. Don't get interlinked with people. You only get hurt. It's a great risk of hurt. I mean, Jesus himself was hurt with the disciples. Jesus risked hurt, right, by depending on the disciples, betrayed and we see that cost in Paul's life, that risk and cost in Paul's life, how he expresses in the verses we read, how people let him down. Do you see what he said in verse 10? Demas has forsaken me. That's somebody he trusted. In verse 16, he says, At my first events, no one stood with me. As a matter of fact, that word forsaken in verse 10 and verse 16, that's a strong word. That word forsaken literally means to get abandoned. And that there's an there's a extra word on the beginning, a preposition on the beginning that strengthens it. To lit, lit, you really left me hanging. <laughs> and it hurt him. Did you hear the hurt in his voice in this passage? Do you hear even the pain sometimes that he bears in his life? As we read this, did you hear that statement in verse 16 when he says, at my first events, no one stood with me. Now, now, hold on a second. Remember I said Paul's still in process. Is it okay that Paul's in process too? Is it okay that we're in process? No one stood with me? It's kind of the same thing he says back in chapter 1, verse 15, when he said, all those in Asia have turned away from me. Now, wait a minute, Paul. Timothy didn't. He was in Asia. So if I may this morning, Paul's tone is almost, can I say this? Is almost exaggeration. It's almost overstated. But have you ever done that when you've been hurt? Have, has something ever hurt you so much that you just kind of like, when you let it out, it just was almost overstated? And it tells you the pain that he's gone through, the risk. So the question is, well, why even do it? If you're going to be hurt, if people are going to leave you in the lurch, that's what this word literally means to if, if people are going to leave you hanging sometimes, why even do it? Why go through it? Because that's the risk of grace, isn't it? Grace is costly. And grace always involves a risk. But I got to be honest with you this morning. <laughs> how, do you, how do you do it, Paul? I'm going to ask him this in heaven. How? How do you go through all? How do you pour your life into people and then get left hanging? You ever done that? You ever poured your life into somebody, invested, trusted, gave your heart, gave your time, invested yourself, just really put yourself out there, and then... You ever had that? You know, it's the equivalent to going to shake somebody's hand and they won't extend their hand, you know? You're just left hanging. It's the, you ever give the hug and it's just kind of the limp fish hug, you know, back? It's the equivalent of, you ever send the text and never get the return? You ever send another text and don't get a return? And then another, and another, and you, you never hear? You ever leave the message and never get a return? You ever pour your life into somebody for months, years, and... 
If you've ever been through that, you can understand why I'm asking this. How? How, how do you do that? And you know, you know the answer as well as I do this morning. It's got to be Jesus in you, doesn't it? It's only Jesus and by the grace of Jesus that a person can allow him to work and invest and keep pouring out your life when there's nothing back. Amen? And I tell you this morning, I believe with all my heart, that's what you're seeing in Paul's life. As the paint is chipping off and as the outward man is perishing, that's what you're seeing in Paul's life. Clear and clear and clear at the very end of his life, you're seeing just Jesus increasing in his life. <laughs> There's so much Jesus inside this man, that's what you're seeing. Come on, I want to be like that. Let the outward man perish, but let it be more and more of Jesus coming out through the cracks. <laughs> And that's what you're seeing in this life, I believe. That's what sanctification does, isn't it? That less of me, more of him. And I know my heart's right, but oh Lord, may it be that, it, that in my words and in my attitudes and in my actions, and Jesus, even when it becomes less and less of me and, and, and towards the end of my life, that even when I... May it be just more and more of you. That's what holiness does. That's what sanctification does. You, you, you understand with me this morning, holiness is the best evangelistic thing we've got in this world. It's what wins people. We want to see more evangelism in our day outside the church. Let there be more holiness inside the church. And a revival, I believe with all my heart, that a revival in the church and in the camp and in the holiness movement, a true holiness revival where we are made more like him increasingly, that's the key to reaching our world, and that's the key to our relationships. Holiness works really good for relationships. Marriage, parents and children, workers, within church, between denominations, <laughs> You believe this morning that by his grace we can actually become sweeter as the years go by. You know, I believe we're going to go one way or the other with people and relationships in our lives. Because the fact is, we are all here this morning going to be hurt by somebody. Amen. All of us are going to be let down, left hanging, maybe today. <laughs> or assuredly this week, this month, or sometime this year, we're going to be left hanging by somebody that we care about or have poured into or invested into. We're going to be left hanging, left in the lurch. And I propose to you this morning, we're going to go one of two ways on that. Either... Please hear this. We will become bitter. Do you know the temptation of the enemy for us to become bitter when people betray us or leave us hanging or forsake us or abandon us? They may not even know they're doing it, and yet, you know what the enemy, you ever know that the enemy can really work on your mind, can he? You ever find yourself mulling over stuff? Just, And I can become bitter. The, the book of Hebrews talks about a root of bitterness. And I, be, I, can, I can be becoming, you know, it can happen over time. It can happen subtly. Frog in the kettle kind of a thing. It can happen subtly. It can, I, I can become, it can become with hurt, and but it can quickly evolve and over time evolve into bitterness, which, which evolves into being prickly and sour and dour and angry. And before I know it, in my, as the years go by, I find myself becoming a bitter, hard, angry person. even in a holiness church. But what Jesus has for us, do you believe this this morning? Instead of going that way when I'm left hanging, do you believe this morning that in his holiness and in what he does only by his grace in my life, I can actually be becoming sweeter as the years go by? Do you believe that this morning? Can Jesus make us sweet? That's what his sanctifying work does in us. And can I say to you this morning, family in Christ, it's that sweetness of Jesus that wins people. 
This is a little unusual. Could I come right down there by y'all? Would that make you want to move back further? I'm gonna come. I want to talk to you a minute, so I'm going to come here. I want to talk to you about how sweetness wins. I was not raised in a Christian home. My family went to a church, but we didn't know anything about holiness or Christ in you and relationship with him. My parents' marriage drifted and fell apart. It's a long story. When I was 15, my, my father left. My mom and my two sisters, me. It's kind of a, a little bit of a destitute situation. Do you know why I started attending a holiness church? I was so smart as a 15 year old, I went down to the public library and looked up all the denominations and the descriptions and I said, I wanna be a part of a holiness church. No. Some people from a holiness church They heard about my family. And the associate pastor came and knocked on. I answered the door that day. We heard about your family, praying for you. He invited us to church. I was 15. My mom and my sisters jumped right in. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Mom joined the church bowling league. This is Chicago. Every potluck, every, every activity, my sisters. I was 15 years old. I had other interests in my life at that time. I had two main interests, two main pursuits as a teenage boy, girls and sports. Those were my two things. I would go every once in a while. Maybe it was a couple weeks. Maybe it'd be a few months. But every single time, when I came to the doors of that holiness church, it didn't matter if it had been a week, it didn't matter if it had been three months, four months, six months. It's like those people, I, I don't know if they had binoculars and they were watching for me or what. It's like they saw me coming. And I'd walk through those doors and they never treat me any different. There was no finger wagging, there was no scolding, there was no rebuke. Those little old ladies would kiss me on the cheek. Those old guys would slap me on the back and talk to me about stuff I was interested in like sports. You know how long they did that for? Two years. Two years of sweetness, two years of love. And when the Lord at age 17 in my last year of high school brought me to a crisis moment, I gave my life to him. Where do you think the first place I wanted to go was? To those people. By the way, a month later, I was called to preach. As uh, Phil and Crystal come and lead us this morning, can I tell you this morning, the sweetness of Jesus wins. I want to testify to you this morning, the sweetness of Jesus wins people. Can I ask you this morning, as I ask myself, which way am I going? I get left hanging sometimes. Anybody? <laughs> am I becoming bitter? 
for his sweetness. It's coming through me. It's being revealed. I say to you again, we are becoming now what we will be. There's no magic holiness wand at the end of life. There's no snap. What am I becoming? Would anybody this morning join me? Jesus, I want you to do, please do your deep, sanctifying, sweetening work in me. Right now, don't wait till 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or five years or one year from now. Jesus, would you do your sweet, sanctifying work in me right now? Come in thy sweetness. Come in thy fullness. Stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Why? What's the only thing we can take to heaven with us? There's somebody in your there's somebody in your congregation, your family, for him to win. Somebody like me in your family or congregation who wants to win. And wouldn't it this morning be worth anything, 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 to take as many as we can to heaven with us? As, as Phil leads us, anybody like to come and ask Jesus, <laughs> oh Lord, your sweet, sanctifying, deep work in me. Don't wait, Lord more and more right now, right where I am. Would you join us in seeking him this morning for that? Thank you. 
in Sirwell First Church and Mount Praise was still over on the old grounds and went down to hear an afternoon service with Keith Drury. He made a statement I've never forgotten. He said, one that's walking with the Lord and becomes bitter, 95%, I don't know where he got his statistic, whether it was just off the top of his head or he had some, you know, survey he did or what, but he said 95% of those that call themselves Christians, become bitter, never get back to that place they once were spiritually. And that was so eye-opening to me. And so let's stay sweet. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and lives and allow Him to truly work within us a work of holiness. Aaron, would you come and close us in prayer? Aaron Long, we appreciate our pastor there. And I'm going to have him close in prayer, but as we bow our heads and close our eyes, once again, let's do some searching. Where are we? Where are we heading? What direction are we going? You know, the Lord, the Lord can pull us back and he can help us. We have wonderful people. And my mind goes to great people who were examples to me. And I know you have those examples as well. May we be examples to others. So God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Juneman, for that powerful message. And Aaron, would you just close us in prayer? God bless you. Would you bow your heads with me as we dismiss in prayer? <clears throat> Gracious Lord, we come to you and bow our heads and bow our hearts to you in everlasting worship to who you are. You are God, our Father. You are the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the indwelling spirit that comes and convicts of sin and cleanses the heart of the inbred sin. Father, this morning we have heard a stirring message concerning the holiness of heart, the sweetness that can come from a sanctified life. Father, my prayer is this morning that you would do that work deep in my heart and deep in my life. Father, make us sweet to the outside world. Let us extend our hands as you extended your hand to us. Father, we pray for a continued deep move of your spirit in the remaining services at the Mount of Praise camp meeting. Father, we pray for the breakthrough of the Spirit in the remaining services. Lord, we pray that a reviving work would continue in our hearts. Let the fires of revival be rekindled on the altars of our hearts over the next few days. Father, we thank you for the victory that's taken place here at these altars. Many years have passed and many victories have been claimed here on these old altars. And Father, we pray that many more will be claimed in the days ahead. Father, we pray, Lord, as we dismiss from this service, but Holy Spirit, we ask that your presence would not be dismissed from our hearts as we continue to walk in the light of holiness until we see the lights of home in the celestial city of God. We glorify you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.